thank you, Jenny, for those kind words and also for uh, giving us the space to host this event. Um, we've been working with Manila for many, many years, advancing indigenous rights from different perspectives. Uh, Manuela comes from political science, that's her PhD. She got it in Florida. Um, then she went to work early on in her career in Ecuador and that changed her life. She started uh, working as a dean in Rio Bamba, which is indigenous land of the Puruais. And so she started organizing um, there and that led to a, you know, years long research that eventually uh, finally coalesced into her first book, um, Indigenous Sovereignties, which by the way, I have taught several times in my classes. Um, why? Because it is a book that turns your uh, understanding of indigeneity on its head. It takes the perspective of women. It is a, a fantastic book that I highly recommend. Manuela also, um, teaches, well, after that, she um, moved back to Amherst, Amherst College, where she has been teaching at the Department of Political Science, but also she teaches in uh, Ecuador at the Universidad San Francisco de Quito, so that she can continue uh, developing these long-term relationships. Besides that, she is well known for her activism nationwide, in regionally, internationally, and in Amherst, there is indigenous studies being carried out thanks to her trailblazing career because she set the ground for now to have initiatives that are uh, inter like college-wise, five college-wise, um, and that are bringing lots of money, resources, and attention to uh, very uh, silenced, uh, you know, area of studies. So Manuela is what else? She's a dreamer, she flies, she sings, she dances. She's a very complete human being with an incredible kind soul. Um, but she's also very productive and smart. So she also has other books that she has uh, co-edited like a, a translation in world politics. But now today she is gonna talk to us about her new book, which is coming out and it is really exciting. And um, so without further ado, Manuela, thanks for being here, for your work, for your decades of research. It is an honor to have you at UNM. Gracias, Antonia. Thank you everyone for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here from Ecuador, even though I'm in Ecuador. <laughs> But it's a pleasure to speak to the UNM crowd from Kichwa Territories. Um, it's a new book that's called um, <clears throat> Savages and Citizens, Indigenous State Relations from Thomas Hobbes to Eva Morales, which I co-authored with Andrew Canessa, who's an anthropologist. And it's an effort between an anthropologist and a scholar of international relations to discuss what is indigeneity. And your series, what's the name of the series, Antonio? You just mentioned it starting. Indigenous politics in the face of the new right. So maybe a starting point for this series is to discuss what does it mean to be indigenous and what is indigeneity, right? If we don't understand what indigeneity is, it may be hard to understand why it's so relevant today and why it's going to be increasingly relevant in the future. Um, some of the big in indigenous intellectuals in Latin America, like Ayruton Krenak, from the Krenak people in the Brazilian Amazon uh, talk about the future being ancestral, right? And either we recover indigenous ways of being in the world, indigenous ancestralities to move into the future or there will be no future, right? And this is a conversation of course about the Anthropocene but it's a conversation about not just the climate crisis but the political crisis we inhabit today, right? Because the climate crisis is fueled and is probably fueling too the emergence of the new rights, uh, the emergence or the consolidation of conservative and author totalitarian, if not authoritarian governments. Uh, we have seen a rise of authoritarian governments. Uh, I think it's 70% of the world now that are authoritarian governments, depending on how we count, it's over 50 to 70. But there's definitely a burst of authoritarianism and what does indigeneity has to do with that, with it? 
So what I wanted to discuss today is what is indigeneity, which is one of our uh, premises in this book, and why does it matter to world politics? And the two key arguments we have is that one, indigeneity is a relational identity, right? It's a, rela it's a political identity that is relational to the state, meaning there is nobody who's indigenous if there isn't a state that passed by. If, if no state passed by, if no colonialism passed by, you're not indigenous, you're Mapuche, you're Kakchikel, you're Kichwa, you are Waurani and uh, Diné, but you're not indigenous. If you're indigenous, it's because somebody came and put that label on you. So in a way, indigeneity is an archaeology of the state, right? So the first idea is that it's a political identity, not a racial identity. Of course, we know by now, and it has been established both from biology and anthropology that race doesn't exist, right? But it's not even a cultural belonging indigeneity, right? It's a political identity relational to the state. So you are indigenous to a state, to a colonial state process, right? And the second argument of the book is that indigeneity is co-constitutive of modern states, meaning not only it's uh, an identity that develops with the arrival of the state, uh, but it's one that defines how the state functions, what kind of colonial states or modern states we are going to see evolve in the Americas in particular. So it's co-constitutive. And if it's a political identity that is relational to the state and co-constitutive of the modern state, then it's absolutely necessary to study indigeneity if we're studying world politics. And if we're studying democracy, for instance, right? The authoritarian turn in contemporary politics. So this is kind of the premise of the book. And uh, the book has um, five chapters. I'll just give you an overview before diving in. Um, the first chapter discusses who is indigenous, what does it mean to be indigenous, and I'm going to discuss that a little bit more in depth. The second one is more theoretical, it's called the state of nature and the nature of the state, right, and one of these uh, ideas uh, of Hobbes and the Leviathan and, and Locke that at the beginning the world was America, this notion that the non-European represents the state of nature and what are the implications and the uses of that for the construction of European colonialism. Um, then we have a chapter that compares indigeneity in Africa and Latin America because there are so many indigenous groups and so many ways of being indigenous that are relational to territory and to how modern European states have come to appropriate territory, right? So, for instance, there is a difference if you're indigenous in Brazil, in the Amazon, you're trying to demarcate territory uh, and you're fighting for the demarcation of territory. You want to be listed, right? The whole fight, I don't know if anybody followed, but the Marco Temporal, the temporal mark that has been going on in Brazil that was just last week canceled, was an effort by Congress, by the, an agribusiness uh, led Congress in Brazil to erase indigenous uh, ownership of the land and territoriality to be able to appropriate it as private property for uh, palm production, soy production, cattle production for global markets, right, for extractive industries. So we compare how, for instance, in Brazil, you want to mark territory, demarcate territory. And if, for instance, if you're from Hawaii, you do not want to demarcate territory. Hawaiians say all of Hawaii is Hawaiian. All of Hawaii is indigenous, right? We've been annexed by the US and we do not want to be on the list of uh, recognized tribes by the Bureau of Indian Affairs in the US because that's an act of colonization. So we, we refuse to be demarcated. We refuse to have part of our land demarcated as ours because everything is ours. So those are different relations to state making, uh, right? That fight for territories in different ways. So comparing Latin America and Africa is to understand different processes of colonization and different ways of being indigenous. Then we have um, a specific chapter on um, Ecuador. Um, indigenous women in Ecuador have been, and that's an object that uh, I go more in depth in my prior book, Vernacular Sovereignties, that Antonio mentioned. But it's these um, concrete struggles, concrete political struggles that Quechua women have led in Ecuador to have uh, gender parity in the administration of justice and to 
spur and consolidate uh, rights to self-determination in ways that went very under under noticed, overlooked by the states, and that in fact increased indigenous self-determination and, and autonomy in the country. And we close with a chapter on Bolivia, who had an indigenous president, right? Asking the question, can the state be indigenous? Can there, if the indigenous is relational to the state and is the outside the state, can the state ever be indigenous or is it a false promise, right? So this is an overview of the book. And I'll start with this idea of indigenous presence as the archeology span of the states. Um, so, I'll go back, and this is the main questions for Bolivia, right? Can the state ever be indigenous? Indigeneity is the outside the state, right? What did it mean to be indigenous? Uh, it meant in colonial process of race making, race invention, right? You invent this identity of indigenous, which at the beginning really only means to not be European. And there are many people who are enslaved from African descent, Latin American descent, what is now understood as indigenous descent who claim indigeneity to escape uh, slavery because the indigenous had a different status than the enslaved Africans, right? But it wasn't really a racial category. At the beginning, it's a legal identity. It's a legal category. It's a legal status. It's a fiscal status, right? On how you pay um, um, impuestos. Um, um, well, no, Access, it's okay. yeah. Access, thank you. <laughs> so there is this production of an, a new identity, right? That is first legal and that becomes racialized. But if you ask um, Waurani people from the Amazon, uh, if they're indigenous, they don't identify, nobody identifies as indigenous. People identify with their territory and with their language, right? So um, it's it's really important as a starting point to establish indigeneity as a settler invention, right? So it's not that indigenous people don't exist, but uh, the concept of indigeneity is an invention. And it's Diné people who exist, it's Choctaw people who exist, it's Waurani people who exist, right? It's Mayamam people who exist. The indigenous is a settler invention that, that becomes an umbrella term that allows to put all of the non-European peoples into one single category, right? And a single category that has no rights, that has no property, but most importantly, that has no sovereignty. So the whole idea of wastelands, um, you can frame entire territories as wastelands, as waste and in opposition to property, as a strategy to deny the sovereignty of indigenous peoples over those territories, right? Um, so it's it's not only a legal category, but it's one that denies the right to property. And, uh, and that categorization is what we discussed throughout the entire book. We like to think about it as dark matter. So the dark matter in astrophysics, right? You cannot see dark matter in space in the universe, but you can see its effects, right? How it bends light, Right or its effect on like um, uh, on the expansion of the universe, right? So you can see its presence, you can feel its presence, how it impacts, how planets revolve, how light bends, um, and all of the theory of star formation has to do like is impacted by that dark matter that one cannot see, but is present, and impacts the way the universe expands. And what we argue is that it's only um, dark matter only appears on the ele electromagnetic spectrum, right? And it cannot be detected visually, just like sovereignty, like uh, invisibiliz invisibilizes indigeneity. Indigeneity is not visible in international relations because indigenous peoples do not have sovereignty. Um, but if you think about the, the creation, the consolidation of the Westphalian state system, it depends on indigenous peoples not have on the presence of indigeneity and indigenous peoples not being sovereign subjects, right? Of not having sovereignty over their territories. If not, all of the Americas could not be European. If not, all of Asia could not be or Africa European, right? So you can only have colonialism with that starting point of indigenous peoples or peoples non-European being framed as indigenous and by definition not having sovereignty. So the indigenous is the outside the state, is the non-sovereign 
And in particular, it's the non-European. And in that categorization, it's the non-Christian, right? So if we go back to the beginnings uh, of the colonial encounter, 1494, the doctrine of discovery. And the doctrine of discovery starts with the etc. bulls, the papal bulls that create the basis for the contemporary modern system of sovereignty. In 1494, the Pope uh, makes a, a few decrees. There are three, uh, so that's why they're called the etc. bulls. But there are papal bulls that establish that none, like the indigenous peoples of America, right? have to be colonized by any means necessary, and that there are non-Christians that need to be brought under the Christian dominion by any means necessary. And this can entail taking the land and taking the people who refuse to be to join Christian dominion. That Those papal bulls that are designed for America, they're actually inspired from the papal bulls for the Crusades, right, five centuries earlier. And it's a reproduction of the infidels being subjugated to Christian dominion. And it clearly states that the non-Christian is non-sovereign. And so what the Papal Bull of 1494 establishes that the first Christian monarchy to arrive into a territory that is not Christian yet, has the authority over that territory, meaning has the sovereignty over that territory. So that Papal Bull gives legal rights to Christian monarchies of Europe to basically appropriate territories. And the underlying idea is that indigenous peoples or the peoples who live in the Americas, right, who are gonna be framed as indigenous, then they're not indigenous yet, they're just infidels, right? And they need to be brought under Christian dominion. So there is this transformation, like, are they human or not human? That's the famous debate of 1550, the Valladolid debate that discusses whether indigenous peoples are human or not. And from now, um, it's often in, uh, discussed or interpreted as a debate on the humanity of indigenous peoples, but it's, it's not really just a racist debate. It's a debate about territory and about sovereignty, because if they're not human, then they don't have sovereignty. If they're human, then they have political authority and they have sovereignty over the territories and the Europeans cannot just arrive and appropriate and plant their flag on the cross to declare it Spanish or Portuguese or French or British. So the debate of Valladolid is really a debate about the legality of appropriating indigenous territories by the, the Americas or the new world by declaring them non-sovereign, right? So if they're non-human, they're non-sovereign, and then we can just grab the land. So it's, a, it's really a debate about the land grab. And scholars, indigenous scholars like Vinnie Deloria, right, have described the doctrine of discovery, like the first Christian to discover appropriates the land. This doctrine of discovery is really the greatest uh, real estate coup in history because it appropriated an entire continent, right, in the name of sovereignty which is a Christian European sovereignty. So the book goes about a lot of these discussion, mostly to discuss um, the international dimension of indigeneity, how it's impossible to think the, the contemporary international system without indigeneity as its root. Um, and then I, we move into why bringing uh, indigeneity into international relations. Because indigeneity is usually studied by anthropologists, right? And I was many times uh, when my my colleagues would see me study indigeneity, they're like, "Oh, you became an anthropologist." I'm like, "No, it's uh, it's politics. It's global politics. It's international politics of resistance, of territory, of borders." Um, and historically, it's the anthropologists who studied the other, right? Who are othering. And not, a, not just otherizing in the indigenous, but the sovereignty that is not European. Um, so the, the effort of this book is to bring in the indigeneity and international relations into conversation, both to indigenize international relations and to politicize indigenous studies in anthropology, right? Because it the state has to be part of the equation and the impact of indigeneity upon the state has to be part of the equation. Um, so why should we bring it into IR in particular, which is my, my part, and I find it really urgent. So the first, the first idea is that indigenous peoples have 
always been doing international relations. So of course we can go to uh, the Waitangi, the Treaty of Waitangi with the Maori, right, 1840, when they're literally making international treaties with the British colonizers. Uh, we can go to um, the US process of or like the British colonization of in the US where for instance in 1713 you have the Eastern Peacock signing in international treaties with the British colonizers and we can go back in time in Colombia the what is now Bogota uh, was the Muisca town of Turmeque and its leaders were pressuring uh, Spanish authorities in recognizing their territories they did a lot of international trips which were months on the boat to Europe to present their maps and explain their territory and their nation and their sovereignty system um, to the British crown, to the Spanish crown, right? So since 15, the early 1500s, you have these um, processes of treaty making, international relations, and indigenous nations, what are called indigenous nations, have been de facto very present in the shaping of international relations. So to do international politics, without their presence is to miss a huge part of international politics, right? It's like doing history without looking at women, right? You're not looking at half of the people, if not more, and many processes that go with it. And so to do Latin American politics or just politics across the new world, which is most of the world, without indigeneity is to miss on many of the dynamics. So it's absolutely necessary. The second idea is that as indigenous peoples were making international relations, um, participating in these treaty makings, they were shaping the emergence of the state, meaning they were constituting, they were co-constitutive of the modern states. The, the, and, and there are historians that have written about that, right? That we cannot think modern sovereignty without understanding how indigenous peoples have forced European nation states, European monarchies to define borders, uh, to use language as a way for territory, right? To create laws in response to the pressure from indigenous peoples. So indigenous peoples were very legalistic, right? Like the Treaty of Waitangi is an interesting one. It was written in Maori and in British. And de facto there are two treaties. Uh, one of the interesting events in in the in the few year, recent years is the um, protection of the um, Wanganui River in Maori territory. That river has been fought for and defended by indigenous Maoris uh, for over 160 years. It's a multi an intergenerational struggle for the, to defend the river, and the challenge comes from the very starting point of the treaty, right? In 1840, when they signed the Treaty of Waitangi, Maoris in Maori language, right, where you have this expression, I am the river and the river is me, understand the river as part of their community, or as part of the family. They belong to the river. The river is not something that can be sold and appropriated, right? So when they make a treaty with the British, they never assume, they never intended or thought that the British could come and by the river or appropriate the river or use the river as a natural resource because it's their mother, it's part of the family. Right? So there's an ontological dissonance. In the British treaty, right, land is something that becomes private property, that is a resource, and the river even more a natural resource to be sold and to be privatized for various interests. So from the starting point, you have this disagreement, ontological disagreement that keeps through time. And finally, in 2016, the river is granted rights, like in the concept of the rights of nature, right, which is another uh, legal paradigm that comes from indigenous worlds, from Ecuador in particular, in that case, uh, in 2000, the 2008 constitution. But that concept permits to evolve into an understanding of a tripartite commission that takes care of the river, where you have a state representative, a Maori representative from the communities, and an, an environmental biologist uh, community representative, three, the three of them together taking care of the river. And it took uh, centuries right, um, to actually get to an agreement. Um, and so when we say in this book that indigeneity is co-constitutive of the states, uh, it's not a light thing, right? The modern states we inhabit today are 
directly the result of indigenous claims, pressure, uh, contestation of in European politics throughout the new world, right? So these are like some of the main ideas that um, we posit in the book. And we treat sovereignty really as the gate. And I'll, I'll close with this image of, um, um, what's his name, um, Kafka, which is actually at the beginning of the book from the introduction. It's called, uh, Kafka writes um, the gate of, it's called Before the Law in English, right? And it's a short story of, uh, a rural countryman that goes to the gate of the law and ask entry. And there is a gatekeeper and the gatekeeper tells him, "We, I cannot let you in. And he says, why? Because you are, this, this gate is to keep you out, right? And the, out of the law. And the countryman asks, will I ever be able to enter uh, this gate? And the gatekeeper responds, it's possible, but not at this moment. Right, so the countryman stays there and keeps trying to enter and the gatekeeper keeps denying him entry. And the time passes and the months passes and the year passes and life passes. And at the end, there is this old countryman who is in front of the gate who's about to die and asks the countryman, but why won't you let me in? Nobody has entered this gate. I'm the only one here and you keep denying me access, right? And the gatekeeper said, yes, this gate was made only for you. And now I'm going to shut it. And it's this notion of the gate of sovereignty as just a system of exclusion, right? The international system depends on sovereignty to exclude indigenous people, right? It is the category used to deny authority, self-determination, autonomy, and to appropriate the territories of indigenous peoples. So the category of sovereignty is the gate of the law, is what has been denied to indigenous peoples for five centuries. And it's the only differential between the modern states and indigenous nations, right? The difference between a nation and a state. And so the whole book is this analysis of how sovereignty is built by Europeans, for Europeans, Right, with this constant uh, dichotomy between the savage, the indigenous savage, the barbarians, which are necessary to have an outside the gate, and the civilized European Christian sovereignty, which is the inside the gate. Right, so the sovereign needs a barbarian, the sovereign needs an Indian that is racialized, that is non sovereign, and that is non Christian. So the, the whole analysis is that, and we finish with. Bolivia, and I won't tell you that will be another talk. <laughs> but the, the analysis of Bolivia is that is if if being indigenous is being the outside the state, can the state ever be indigenous? And what does it mean that Evo Morales was an indigenous president? And having an indigenous president or being an indigenous president, does it make the state indigenous? Or will the state, by definition, always be non-indigenous? So what we hope with this book is to bring indigeneity to the center of international politics and, and sovereignty studies, but also in addition to contributing to this theoretical conversation is to expand the imaginary, right? And try to think beyond state sovereignty because we're in a time of climate crisis, of climate collapse, of Anthropocene collapse in which the world we inhabit is unsustainable. The societies we have built are unsustainable, unhealthy, fragmented suicidal, right, from the fentanyl in the US to the climate crisis and the narco politics in South America. We're in a mode of self-destruction and self-sabotage where the implosion is evident at so many levels uh, without even going into the um, environmental disasters. How do we step out if not through the reinvention of the state and the reimagination of the states and of, of our polities, right? and and how we live together, through what authority system, to what self-determination system, and how do we rebuild, restore these relations? So this is kind of like the open door that we leave for a conversation and for thinking the future. Thank you, Manuela. <clears throat> yeah, this idea of indigeneity as the dark matter is really enticing indeed. Um, 
because you do, you can feel. And I was imagining that you were going to talk more on this end point, right? On, well, first of all, you don't tell us, but is it? Does an indigenous president make the state indigenous? I imagine the answer is no, right? But in the context of uh, Latin America today, mm -hmm. and these narco states and these, you know, return rights and these, you know, boastful lefts, I don't even know what to call them. Um, <laughs> there is the, there is the fight for for the state of nature and the nature of the state. You were pointing to that, no? This idea that it is not about whether we should include or not include. It's not about inclusion or exclusion. It's about planetary survival, right? Like I've been talking about whether indigenous people are part or are not part, you know, of society for decades and, you know, we can keep on going since 1550, but the point is that, as you can say, it's this expansive imagination that that needs to get us into, into understanding the centrality of this in terms of the difference, not just of the territory, but of diversity, you know, like 80% of life on earth is on indigenous lands. and diversity, linguistic diversity, epistemic diversity. And so um, how does that fit into the international politics that you can, that you invite us to envision? Mm -hmm. So for instance, the idea is that the barbarian and therefore the Indian is a solution to the state, right? It's, if you do not have a savage, what does it mean to be modern and civilized? If you do not have the masculine, what is the feminine, right? If you do not have women, gays, what does it mean to be a macho man? So in those dichotomies, uh, modernity and European needs its outside. Um, you can put it, it's other, it's enemy, it's savages, it's barbarians. And it's, and it's really interesting when you start looking at things that way, because for instance, we don't think about Kurdish people as indigenous. And yet in Iran, in the, uh, Kurdish people are called tribal, just like the tribal people of India. And what does it mean to be tribal if not being a barbarian who does not have sovereignty? And what all indigenous peoples have in common, even though they may not be from the Amazon and have been colonized by the Spaniards or the British, is that they do not have a state and they're denied not only sovereignty, but to be denied sovereignty, they're denied reason, right? So there is this animalization and dehumanization because to be human is to have sovereignty. To be human is to have self-determination. So the denial of self-determination, which is one of the definitions of sovereignty, is what defines the Indian. And it is a solution to the international system. We would not have the international system of Westphalia modern states without having the Indian. What is Westphalian sovereignty based on? One of the criteria is right in theory of international relations of sovereignty is mutual recognition. United Nations, right? They're together meeting at the UN this, this last week. What does it mean to be sovereign for Ecuador that Colombia, Peru, and Brazil recognizes the borders and yet you're in a sovereign state. Russia and the US may and China may, may all not get along. <laughs> but they recognize each other's sovereignty. They recognize each other's borders and they play with that. Indigenous peoples are the ones who do not have borders, who are crossed by borders, right? And we can go to Anzaldua, right? Those who are crossed by the borders. And, and it's part of what racialization in a way is to be crossed by a border, right? And to cross borders and be crossed by the borders. So the relevance of, indigeneity is almost I'm like sometimes I look at it I'm like how did we study international relations for a century without talking about indigeneity it's crazy it's insane <laughs> and to go to Bolivia of course we we think there is it's impossible for a state to be indigenous and actually indigenous peoples refuse most of them it's a constant dilemma among indigenous politics uh, and leaders 
do we enter the state? Do we stay outside the state, right? This is something that I have, have experienced in my activism and in our work running for president, right? Do we run? Do we not run? But we can't change anything. The state will never be indigenous. Yeah, but at least we can expand self-determination from within the state so that indigeneity can grow outside the state. All of the processes, Ecuador has been leading the way, not just with the rights of nature, but with the process of the consultation for the Yasuni in the Amazon, right? In which there was a popular vote, ballotage, on should we leave oil, crude oil underground, or should we drill it and export it on global markets? And over 60, about 60% 60 of Ecuadorians voted to leave oil underground, right? And it's an act of post-extractivism, Right, and of recognition of indigenous sovereignty and of the significance of nature, not just clean nature for our health, but nature as having rights and as being an ecosystem that should be our political horizon, right? Um, but then of course the government already said, no, we're not gonna recognize it. And so it's this constant dilemma, where do we do the politics of the future? Do we do them from within the state? from outside the states, from indigenous grounds. What does it mean to be indigenous, right? Many scholars like Jeff Corntassel and, um, and some others um, who, who discuss indigeneity as an act of resistance, as a relation to territory and as a resistance against ongoing forms of colonization, in which sense, you know, it's not about being Cherokee or Waurani to be indigenous, it's about connecting to your territory, defending your territory from this state politics of extraction. And this leaves open many groups that don't necessarily identify as indigenous to do indigenous politics, right? Of nature, of territory, of resistance, and of communal resilience, right? Uh, the Maya scholar, um, uh, Gladys Tultul talks about indigeneity as communal resistance, right? Communal relations of resistance. And that expands what it does it mean to be indigenous and what do we do with that indigeneity, right? If Kurdish identify as indigenous and do indigenous politics of self-determination, which they do in Rojava, for, for instance. And the Sami, <laughs> who oh, recently yes. got their rights recognized in Congress, and they did a reading of the of the findings of this Truth and Reconciliation Committee, and they read it live for twenty seven hours. It was insane. Wow. Amazing. And it was read in Norwegian. It was not read in Sami. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, this occupying space, right? This politics of occupation, of reoccupying spaces through language mm -hmm. i was thinking also in new groups that all of a sudden take the center stage of indigeneity and all of a sudden bring all kinds of questions to different places that you wouldn't think of indigeneity such as sweden or norway or as you're saying iran or in africa in various parts or even in india or anywhere right it's like that conflict is gonna be there and it's gonna yeah. going to continue. Um, I wanted to open the floor for questions from our audience. I don't know if anyone in the audience would like to say something or ask. We can go in the chat or you can unmute yourself. I don't think that there's any hardcore regulations. Or am I? But I wanted to more talk on this idea of the archaeology of the state. That's another thought that was very interesting to me. Um, when I study indigeneity, I do this deep memory thing, right? So where you go into like, not this generation, but the previous generation and the one before and the one before and see this like longer pattern of, of resistance, yes, but also of articulations um, of that resistance. Um, and, I like this this idea of the archaeology of the state in that way you were proposing something like that. So can you give us some specific examples of, of the archaeology of the state that you may be giving the uh, book? Yeah, the idea, the, the main idea is that there is no 
indigeneity without the states. And if we tend to think about indigeneity as something outside the state, disconnected, you know, we're indigenous peoples in the Amazon, maybe in the Himalayas, um, in reservations in the US, but they're away from the state, outside, disconnected, prior, right? And it's these things of the past, romanticized indigeneities. But in fact, indigeneity is the most modern thing there is because it is an indicator right? Just like you make a hole and you find ruins, it's a ruin of the state. It is an indicator that a state passed by and invented itself as modern, right? That a political system came and decided I am modern and they're not and I'm going to take over, right? So it's an archaeology um, and it's an indicator of modernity. So the most interesting for us is to think about indigeneity as modern, right? And as an indicator, a barometer of, the, of modernity, so there's, you have some, thank you for organizing and facilitating. Congratulations, Manuel, on your publications, says Maria Casa. Mia Galvan says thank you, and also Yvette Gonzalez. But then you have, Yvette says, I wonder if you could expand on the realm of language in validation of indigeneity of supposed frontiers between ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. And so it's indigeneity is a very ambiguous identity, partly because it's a political relational identity, right? And it's gonna change from one side to the other. So for instance, one of the main indigenous, the largest indigenous group in the world is Quechua. It's the language, Quechua is a language and it's a language that has a history of colonization, right? That was used, that was spread through a religious Catholic colonization, right? that now is a language that is common to indigenous groups from Colombia to Argentina, Brazil, Peru, Bolivia, Chile, Ecuador. It's everywhere and there are many Quichuas, right? And Quichua is a nationality, it's a nation, it's an indigenous group within which there are many peoples, right? And there are many subgroups. But it's important to understand that even though it's an it's considered as a nation, it's really a language that has shaped the identity of the nation, right? Part of the hypocrisy or the uh, the problem with indigeneity is that it's a concept that homogenizes this multiplicity of groups, and and most groups, most nations identify with their languages, right? So the Tikuna people from the Brazilian Amazon they speak Tikuna. The Witoto, they speak Witoto, and they speak each other's languages. They have their neighbors, but they each speak their language. In the case of the Quechua, right, it's many groups that were colonized uh, by Spaniards and Catholicism in a very specific process of using Quechua as the indigenous language, right? So every indigenous group will have a different process, including with language, right? And language revitalization is, of course, important. But some indigenous language were used for colonialism, like the Quechua. In most cases in North America, you have revitalization of, in, of indigenous languages as a form of revitalizing the politics, the community, and the territory. And of course, in the language, you have a lot of concepts for territoriality that cannot be translated. So it's really important to revitalize languages as a way, as a tool to revitalize political system, forms of governments that cannot exist in English or in Spanish or in French or in Portuguese, right? So language is, has to be studied in context, in territory, right? Uh, to, so that we can grasp what language does in which contexts. But it is a central element of emancipation and recovery of self-determination. This reminded me that tomorrow I'm giving a talk with just that topic of indigenous linguistic revitalization, but I don't have the information. It is in the language learning center. So maybe in news and events, let me see if there's something, but yeah. Um, it is interesting what you say about the Kichwa, right? Um, and Thinking of, um, that's why I said the Chimborazo were really Puruais, because there's like all the different nations that then make that distinction. But also 
the relation to the language will change from one time to another, in which times you embrace it, in which times you have to withdraw um, for processes of survival or um, uh, processes of, of uh, migration, uh, deterritorialization, right? Um, for example, many, many indigenous people will say, oh, my parents didn't teach me the language, right? That it's is survival. a very, yeah, it's a very common form of uh, epistemicide that's endogamic to cultural practices that are even within communities, but they are because of socioeconomic factors, right? Mm -hmm. um, this is something we see in Ecuador all the time. Uh, my partner, Yaku, his mother, when he asked his mother, why didn't you speak Kichwa to me? Because his parents didn't speak Spanish until late in life, right? But then they raised the kids in Spanish. And he's like, why didn't you teach me Kichwa? And she said, what did you want? To be after the cows, like, stuck in the, the mountains like me your whole life? Yeah, and that's the what media says that when he's not indigenous because he doesn't speak fluent each and, and then you're accused of not being indigenous for not speaking the language yeah mm -hmm. there's a adriana says congratulations on your publication and i was wondering if you have some thoughts about indigenous protests especially when it comes to land rights and environmental issues it seems to be a topic that cross the regional boundaries of countries but at the same time is an expression of the lack of power and sovereignty so maybe the key point is that Indigeneity is about land and colonialism is about land, right? It's, genocide is about clearing the land. Um, in, in, the, in some of the chapters of the book, especially in what it means to be indigenous, we talk about definitional violence, which is what Antonia just mentioned, right? You, are, you don't speak English, you don't speak Kichwa, you don't speak a native language, therefore you're not indigenous. And that's a way to keep erasing indigenous peoples from the map to take over their territories, right? So the definition of violence, who gets to define what does it mean to be indigenous? Usually the state, right? self arrogates it for itself, the rights to define who is indigenous, in which territories. And so that way you grab the land. So to be indigenous is about land. And to be indigenous today is about defending land and territory from the land grab, which is, you know, of course it's by the state, but it's usually for extractive industries more and more, right? Whether it's tourism, oil, mining, who are trying to make money on global markets. So to be indigenous is about protecting the land and the territory. And so your question, uh, Adriana, um, land is central. Uh, and they, they some in, in English, they talk about land, right? The land back, take the land back, uh, returning the land, rematriating the land. In Latin America, they talk increasingly about territory because land is this very colonial concept, right? Of a piece of land that you buy. Territory is something else. Territory is sovereignty. It's unbuyable. Territory is the river who's your grandmother and the mountains and the clouds and the rains and the biodiversity that lives on that. And it's all of our relations that, and the territory moves with you, right? You go to the city, but you, your body is the territory. Your body is indigeneity. In the US, I think about 50% of indigenous peoples are in urban settings in Brazil and Canada is about 70% because, of course, the violence, the genocide have, have pushed indigenous peoples out of their territories into um, urban settings, but they carry the territory with them. And we can see even when the language is gone, their ancestral knowledge is about plants, about food, um, about relations to spirits, relations to nature, right? where you can recognize indigeneity in the making or indigeneity uh, undercover, let's put it that way. So uh, to go back to your question um, about indigenous politics and indigenous protests, they always are about land, I would say. They're always about territory, whether it's education and language revitalization because language is territory or whether it's about concretely a physical territory and a physical piece of land. Uh, because it's where the language lives, it's where the identity lives, and most importantly, it's where autonomy lives. You cannot be sovereign without a territory. And the territory has to be understood as the land, the bodies, the nature, the spirits that live in, in those relations. Right. So it's always about land. And 
I would say that the, so for instance, in Ecuador, you have uh, the emergence, Ecuador is an important example and case of indigenous protests. It's the most successful indigenous protests in the world. They were able to shut down the country in the 90s, various times. They're able to reshape the constitution, um, to, but like create an indigenous political party. The indigenous political party in Ecuador was the second political force in Congress. They had 27% of Congress uh, as of 2021, right? They have but many politicians. There was an indigenous woman who was um, um, Minister of International Relations uh, back in 98, Nina Pakari, way before Deb Harlan was appointed, right? There is a long history of indigenous people participating in politics in Ecuador. And it was in the, until the 90s is what about the agrarian reform and about land back, right? And having rights to land and not being treated as cattle and sold as in the slave systems in the, called the Wasipungo. But nowadays we are still talking about land. Now it's in the context of nature, the defense of nature, right? the protection of rivers, the protection of water in a context of the Anthropocene and the sixth mass extinction and the destruction of life of our Casa Grande, right? It's still about land. It's just more nature because now we are identifying extractive industries as the main problem of grabbing the land, but it's about land grab and water grab still. Mm redefining the conceptions we have about the place we live in. Thank you. Um, I don't know if anyone um, had other questions or thoughts. Um, if not, this was this was fascinating. It's, it really helps think a lot of relations and what we do in our daily lives and our relationship to other people and to the resources we have. It's an awesome talk, says Adrian. I'm glad you liked it and, and come back. Our next talk is going to be an, another friend in common with Manuela, uh, Josiane Guillermi. And she's coming in October. It's it's so that you remember if you are a frail of mind, you can remember that it's 4321. So it's the 4th of September, which is today. And then thereafter will be on Wednesdays, Wednesday the 3rd. Wednesday of October and the 2nd of November and the 1st of December. Um, and yes, we do want to talk about this indigeneity uh, transnationally. Um, and when we talk about politics, not about electoral politics, but uh, politics in a larger sense um, of the word, no? And uh, thank you for opening uh, the talk and um, yeah. And I'll close, know. maybe I'll close giving a little um, promotion of Josie. It's Josie Tikuna, who's coming to speak in the next uh, event, is a, is a very important leader of indigenous politics in the Amazon. Water uh, defender, yeah. Water defender, uh, territorial defender, and sexuality defender. <laughs> One of the interesting things about indigeneity is that the the heteronormativity didn't exist in most indigenous cultures or in most pre-colonial worlds across the continent. The Europeans arrive, whether it's the British, the Russians, the French, the Portuguese, the Spaniards, they all say, oh, this is the land of sodomites, right? Because gender was a much more fluid uh, identity. Um, it, there were multiple genders. And for instance, in Tikuna, which is an isolated language, you already have women who loved women. You, you have words for that, right? And it's an isolated language deep into the Amazon. So there is nothing new about the LGBT. And you have people like Josie who have been defending ancestral forms of governance, which in part come with homo affective families and relations, right? Uh, in which families were defined by the clan and not by sexuality and gender. And Josie has been doing a lot of that work. She has been persecuted. Uh, she suffered assassinations attempts recently, this, a few months ago, by evangelical groups that are increasingly working with the um, miners, right, together to grab territory and disappear indigenous peoples and their nations in a way to clear the land for mining, illegal mining in particular. So she's at the forefront of this defense of territory. 
uh, of nature, the, the physical land and the body as territory, right? For that memory of other ways of inhabiting the world, those politics beyond the electoral realm that Antonia mentioned. So I highly encourage you to come to her conversation. Um, thanks for everybody who's coming and please uh, pass the word for the next uh, event in October. And thank you, Manuela. And we will be talking after everyone disconnects for your payment details. Thank you. Thank you so much for the space and good luck with the series. See you soon. Thank you, Bye -bye. Manuela.